Evening, Almond Glen. My name's Rob Smith. I'm the current president of the Almond Glen Owners Association, and it is, it's almost 1030 at night on uh, August the 4th, Sunday. So um, I'm getting ready to head to bed for the night, but um, had a discussion come up, and I, even, even the, the discussions that pop up on Facebook, and I, and I have to admit, I don't watch Facebook too often. I pop up on there, and I, I'll see something where I'm tagged, and I, uh, I go back and watch them. So I'll admit, even the discussions where people are not happy with me are useful and are they're useful. Um, sometimes they're useful because I'm like, but why me? <laughs> so um, I'm I'm the vocal one. I'm the one on the board in the position where I'm I'm out there out front. And uh, you know, you've seen a, a couple different styles because people forget the boy stepped in as the uh, president the last year that I was on the board of, of the ten year stretch, and then you had um, last year's style. So you've had different styles of people who are in the um, in the president slot, and you know, for the most part, I've kind of handled it as a spokesman position. I step up and I say, "Here, here's what's going on." So I know not everybody likes watching the videos, and some people do, and and feel free to um, talk about them on Monday, I guess. But uh, a couple things I want to throw out there. Number one, um, the the board of directors had. Uh, well, I guess there's no reason to be like dance around it, Andrea. Um, asked to step down from the board of directors this last week. Uh, she's had a lot of things going on, so we wish her the best of uh, the best with everything she's she's going. You know, I don't, there's nothing bad. She just she's got a lot going on, so um, I get that. It's a it's a big commitment being a part of um, of this stuff, and and she was just like she knew she wouldn't be able to commit going forward, so she asked if she could just step down. Just said, hey, I'm gonna need to step away. And the number one thing I would say is thank you to Andrea for her previous year and then for getting us started this year. Um, because, you know, there's there's two members from last year's board that were came over with us and that's that's helped. So with that said, uh, the board directors had to vote to replace her. That's something that happens um, at our level. And there's no officer positions that had to change. The, the president, vice president, secretary and treasurer remain the same. Andrea was um, was just, just on the board as a board member. She didn't hold an officer position. So we replaced her with Heather Finch, uh, we reached out to her. She had expressed some interest and uh, the board was in agreement. So she came on board. So um, probably put that as an official thing in our next meeting. But for those who catch these videos, you'll see that here. <clears throat> the other thing I want to throw out there is, you know, in, in regards to things like the townhome budget, the, I get it that the concern is that there's going to be a big townhome dues increase because Rob's back on the board. I am just one member of the board. I have always just been one member of the board. Um, there, there's been a recent, somebody said something recently about how I have the power and everything. I don't have any power over anybody. I don't, David was the, the, the president last year. Reach out to David and ask him, if, ask him, hey, did you have all the power to do whatever you wanted to do? Um, I think I heard Justin talk more than I heard David talk last year. Um, I heard Andrea quite a bit. I heard Jen, I, I heard a lot of voices. There were there were a lot of voices. Petra was talking. Um, it seemed to me like they they all had an input on what happened. I would I would even the things I wasn't happy about. Like I question how the budget was done last year. I don't blame uh, Justin for how the budget was done last year. Justin could have done a great job on the budget, laid it all out perfectly, and the board may have voted completely opposite of what he wanted, or he may have laid out a terrible budget, and the bu and the board voted for it because it's what they thought was right. And, you know, you also have to remember, too, just because, just because the board didn't do what I like doesn't mean that the board did anything illegal or, or wrong. Um, I think some people think that we think that they, those of us who disagreed with how things were done last year, that we think that the board did something wrong. I, there's, there's nothing wrong or illegal about overfunding or underfunding the reserves. Previous boards that I was a part of, um, one year I, I recall we, the board specifically voted to underfund the reserves to be able to take on some maintenance issues. Last year's board primarily was trying to handle a lot of deferred maintenance. I've been a part of boards who have voted to defer maintenance. That doesn't mean I always agreed with deferring maintenance. I'm just one member. <laughs> so um, one thing that we do have that I, that, that I did not like last year, well, one that we had on previous boards that they did not do last year was we, 
we recorded meetings in the past. So um, it's it's possible to go back and see us talking about things and and arguing over different stuff and not agreeing all the time and, and, and how we came to those conclusions. Last year's board did not do that. Um, and quite honestly, it's, it's something we've kind of run into at this board where I very much, and, and I, I think when I say I, this is my personal opinion, but there are multiple members of the board who agree, would like to have our meetings in an open forum where you can see us asking questions. Now, that happened in our last board meeting and uh, it did not make everybody happy. And, and I get that. It's, there, it was very much a, hey, why did you guys do what you did? Fill in the details for us. That doesn't mean that they were wrong, but what we don't have is we don't have the why behind the what from last year. You can't go, you can't go back and watch videos and see a discussion of um, how things happened. Like you guys just spent, you decided, decided to buy a, a pool cover, for instance. Let's talk about the pool cover. This is like 17 grand. You decided to spend to buy a pool cover. It deferred maintenance um, down the road because it saves, it keeps the pool say uh, in better condition for longer. Basically, the surface of the pool. They had gotten to a point where they said, "Hey, we've saved. If everything was right, the pool replacement for the lining. If I remember, I'm gonna throw some numbers out. I could be wrong. It was like fifty some thousand dollars." The lining is actually going to cost like seventy some thousand dollars, almost eighty, I think it was. Um, but the good news is you don't need to replace the pool. The bad news would be, I think, doesn't sound like we saved enough. If we thought we needed, if we were on track and saving, then we needed. We had saved fifty some thousand for something. They said if you need it today, it's almost eighty. So we didn't have enough money saved up for it anyways, but instead they spent 17 of the 50 some that we had saved. And, and again, these are all kind of arbitrary numbers on the pool cover. Well, how long will the pool cover get us down the road? What was the decision behind that? How long will that pool cover last? We don't know because none of that was discussed in an open forum. It was just one day there was a pool cover. I drove by, I saw it and I'm like, I know about the pool covers. I remember we, our pool company tried to sell us a pool cover every single year because it's a custom pool cover, it was expensive, it would make maintenance for them easier in the, in the uh, summer when things rolled around the spring and, because it was easier to clean the pool and everything. So every year they wanted to sell us a pool cover. And every year we were like, gosh, that's gonna cost like between 15 to $20,000 on top of money we're already trying to save and we've got, a, we've got all this other stuff we gotta do. So we never saw the benefit in it. Now, the other board, last year's board may have made that decision on good information, but we don't know what that information was. So if I get into a meeting and I go, tell me about the pool cover. We spent $17,000 to put a pool cover on. Why didn't you guys do that? Well, then immediately the throwback on that is you're being so derogatory and accusatory and you're pushing them but like, no, <laughs> I just want to know the answer. The, they may give an answer. They may say, well, we thought it was the right thing to do because they said it would make the pool last another two years before we need resurfacing done. And then that may turn out to be, in the end, it may be a financially terrible decision. I've made ter financially terrible decisions. We all have. It doesn't mean that they're bad people. Um, it just means that they just, you know, they acted on the information they had at the time. Um, and as a group, <laughs> that's ultimately, if three people said, let's do it, and two people said, don't, then that's it. The board voted to. Now, the two who are against it might stand up and say, hey, listen, I was fully against that. And I never thought we should. And I wouldn't have voted to do that. And if you elect me back to the board in the future, I would vote against these things. And, and that's what you do. You kind of align yourself with individuals. When people are like, you know, why does Rob keep getting voted back to the board? It's because apparently when I speak and I have a thought process about things and I have individual conversations with people, it resonates with a lot of the community and they go, that's what I would do if I was on the board. I just don't, I just don't have the time or, or the interest to put up with it, or I don't want to get yelled at by people on the internet. So that's just one board member's point of view. It doesn't mean everybody feels the same way. It absolutely doesn't mean that my opinion drives anything more than anybody else. I'm just, I'm just one guy who lives in the neighborhood who, uh, it, it really is trying to do the best thing for the community. Um, and I, and I'm not, I'm, I don't know. I, I get painted quite a bit as this horrible woman hating, uh, <laughs> this is funny. Anytime I get that stuff about the, 
you know, oh, Rob hates women. Like, why? Because I didn't agree with a couple women who were yelling at me or who disagreed with me. Like, I'm allowed to disagree with you. I don't have to agree with you and be like, oh, if I disagree with you, you're a woman. I'm, I have, so I have to agree with you. Like, no, I don't, I don't care if you're a man or a woman. If I don't agree with you, I don't agree with you. Um, and I don't have a problem saying it. I'll, I'll say it to everybody. I'll tell it to you. It doesn't mean I don't like you though. I have plenty of people who I've disagreed with in the neighborhood who later on reach out to me and say, Hey, can we do this or that? And I'm like, yeah, we can do that. Let's help you out. Um, no matter how mean you were to me on the internet. <laughs> so, um, we can put all that stuff aside. I don't care. Uh, it doesn't, it's not personal. I mean, it is personal. It's personal from you to me, but it's not from me to you. Um, I don't, I don't take any of it personally. Uh, I kind of move on from it. I got other things to do. We've all got other things to do. So if I live rent free in your head, that's on you. Um, you need to, you need to work on that. But I don't hate women. I, I think I've served on the board every single year with women. I reached out to Shanda personally this year with all my woman hatingness and asked her if she wanted to run on the board um, with me. I served with Virginia for years. Uh, Heather, this week I reached out and was like, hey, I think Heather's a good vote. Um, Shanda reached out, was like, hey, I think Heather's a good vote. That's another woman. My wife's a woman, my daughter's a woman. <laughs> I, don't, I don't dislike women. I work for a woman. Um, and my second job, a job that I do, I don't hate women, so I don't know if, if somebody has told you that. The women who know me well throughout the community will tell you flat out, like, Rob doesn't have a problem with women. I do have a problem with certain policies, procedures, and things that we've done. we got to find a way to balance the budget flat out and make sure we're on the right page. My number one question for this board is, how much money do we need to have in reserves? Because you've got to remember, I don't do the numbers every year. I've gone off of... Um, uh, darn, I forgot Mr. Bell's first name. Uh, it's not Roger. Roger is his son, for those of you who know Roger. Um, but Mr. Bell, and he was a part of a committee that put together the original kind of budget plan. And then Sid came in, and Sid McIntyre, uh, who was a finance guy for a multi-million dollar uh, logging company, Sid came in and he put together the budget. And we looked at the first reserve study, I want to say 2015. Um, and then along came Eric, which Eric gets a lot of the, uh, a lot of the hate because Eric's vocal. He's a vocal guy. Um, and he has no problem saying what he's thinking. Eric went off of Sid's numbers and redesigned the budget based off his numbers and tried to really divide out the finances so that you could see where townhome dollars are going and single family dollars are going. Cause you gotta remember the townhome folks, there's the general budget, which is the big stuff in the community. You think like the swimming pool, the lights in the community, stuff like that. Everybody pays into that. So that is dollars to take care of pool divided by uh, 295. And then, which is a total number of homes, in, single family and townhomes in the neighborhood. And then the townhome owners also have the ta townhome expenses. So when you look at the expenses for the townhomes and you wonder like why do the townhomes pay so much? Because the single family homeowners only pay for the general stuff in the neighborhood, which the town homeowners also pay for. And then the town homeowners pay for their expenses too. So for instance, think the dumpsters, which is something we were talking about tonight on Facebook. The dumpsters, um, different lawn care that goes on just for the townhomes. So the townhomes have to pay for lawn care to mow the pool neighbor, the pool parking lot, or not the pool parking lot, but you know, the pool area. The single families pay to mow the pool area. So we all pay in equally on that. So let's say that that's a, a $295 is the bill to mow the grass. It's not, but make it simple. Everybody in the neighborhood pays $1. And then they, let's say that it's an additional $64 to mow the townhomes area. It's not, it's just make it simple. The single family homeowners don't pay a penny towards that. So that's a dollar per town homeowner. So to mow the grass every week, Again, saying it was um, $295 to mow, the sing to mow the general area and $64 to mow the townhome area. The townhome owners all pay $2 per week to mow the grass and the single family homeowners pay $1 per week. So literally in that circumstance, they're paying double. Again, these are, these are fictional numbers. Hopefully that's making sense. And man, I'll sit down with a pad of paper and knock it out for anybody in the neighborhood. So I've, I've asked Justin, to break those numbers out. What are the operating costs for the neighborhood? What are the operating costs for the townhomes? 
And then once we have those numbers, we can say, okay, this many pennies per person should be going per home, should be going into just the operating budget every year. I've had those numbers from previous, um, from previous budgets. And that's where we would look at the budget and say, we gotta raise the dues, we gotta lower the dues, whatever. Last year, the board voted to raise the dues of the single family homeowners I might be wrong, but I think it was a total of like $36,000, 35, 36. I think that's right. Cause I, I feel like we went from, well, I think we went up like 40 bucks a quarter. I don't have the numbers in front of me. I'm sorry if I'm getting this wrong. Um, but if you raise the dues of the single family homeowners, $36,000, does that mean the year before the single family homeowners didn't pay $36,000 of their money that they needed to pay in to, like that means the townhomes, because remember for every dollar that a single family homeowner pays in, the townhomes have to pay in. So if we paid $36,000 in from the townhomes or from the single family homes, that means the equivalent number of dollars needs to come in, not 36,000, but their portion of that needs to be paid in. So there's, there's a number off there. There's a, it's a, it's, there's a number off either the single family homeowners were underpaying and they needed to pay that 36,000 in to get back right. Or the single family homeowners paid an additional 36,000. What do we do with that money? Uh, it's, it's, it's off. You don't just arbitrarily raise the dues though. And one of the things I heard last year that made me throw my hands up and go, what is, you know, we need to bring those numbers up to where they previously were. We gave up all this revenue. It's not revenue to give up. If, if you come in and you say, hey, there is a need, like if we all were paying no dues today and you came in and said, hey, we have a bill for this community and the bill is, you know, like I said, let's use the 295. The bill is $295. Well, what you do is you say, hey, what does that bill benefit? Is that bill benefiting the townhomes or is it benefiting like, a general thing and they say well it's to um, put a new street light in well then we divide that 295 by everybody in the neighborhood we all pay a dollar in but if you come in and you say it's a 295 dollar bill and um we're it's it's gonna benefit just the town homes well, now you divide it by 64. so it's always about like starting from zero like let's let's just build it up and let's make sure everybody sees oh that's how much money it costs to to do operating expenses then we need to look at the reserves and say how much money do we have in reserves how much money does the town home do the town homes have in reserves how much money does the general budget have in the reserves because remember we all pay into the general budget equally that's not a single family there is no such thing as a single family homeowner expense or a single family homeowner reserve it's all general townhomes and single family, and then there's a separate townhome one. So how much money do the townhome owners have? Because in theory, if, the, if you needed to replace, like say you needed to paint the, uh, the pool and we're gonna take it from reserves, that doesn't come out of the townhome owners reserves, that comes out of the general reserve. So we need to say, hey, how much money do we have in the general reserves? How much money do we have in the townhome reserves? Then the, the answer to the biggest, the big answer that we need, the, the hard answer is how much money do we need to have? And I've pointed this out several times. I've been told multiple times, we have plenty of money in the reserves. We've got $800,000 in reserves. We've got plenty of money or 600 and some thousand operating costs. And we've got, we got plenty of money. Okay. Plenty. What does that mean? Anybody who is planning for retirement knows that there's a difference between having plenty of money and there's a difference between having enough money to to live on so a good financial advisor is going to say you need to at least have this number of dollars in an account to live off of when you re when you retire and it's going to be as big as a number as you can get there's always going to be the like it would be great if we had you know 62 million dollars in our reserves because then we could look and go hey do we need 62 million hundred dollars or 62 million dollars in reserves and we could spend as much money as we need to to get things done but we don't we have a we have a finite number so how much money do we need to have in our reserves if you plan to live here for the next year we have plenty of money 
Uh, if you're going to sell your house in the next five years, you're probably good. We probably have plenty of money. I, I feel confident that if you're, if, if you're planning to live here for another five years, we have plenty of money. Now, I am concerned that if you plan to live here beyond five years, you will find yourself in a hardship where we will start to run out of money depending on how we spend and how we save. And my mindset is, I don't care if I plan to live here for just another two years, another five years, or another 15 years. Um, I want to make sure that the money is set appropriately. Because what we, can't, what we can't do is we can't run in a situation where we're out of money and the neighborhood has to say, okay, well, we need every homeowner has to pay in $100 and you have 30 days to pay it. Because there's one that puts financial hardship. And two, um, and I'm using hundred dollars as an arbitrary number because I could see some people going, well, if you needed a hundred dollars, I'd be fine. Okay. Well, let's make it 2000. Let's make it 3000. Let's make it 10,000. Every woman needs $10,000 in the next 30 days, whatever number, whatever number is enough to you to go, wow, that'd be tough to come up with <clears throat> because one, it put hardship and two, the neighborhood would have to have a super majority vote to get that passed. That's not happening. Are you voting to, to, uh, to say yes to we need a new pool and it's going to cost $300,000? Someday the pool will have to be replaced. Someday. It may be 30 years from now. Um, it may be 50 years from now. The reserve study gives us an idea. Someday everything will need to be replaced. The pool house, the pool building will need to be tore down. It'll, one day it will get rotten and old and need replaced, and it will have to be torn down, maybe in phases, maybe at all one time. Um, and it may not be some cataclysmic event that comes through and wipes it out and the insurance company has to replace it. Everything in the neighborhood. There's a big retaining wall down off of, I think it's in Kilchurn. Um, it's a huge retaining wall. One of these days it's going to have to be, it's going to have to have maintenance done to it. It's going to have to have work. And that may be $100,000 worth of work. That's what the reserve study does is it kind of estimates that out. And I've used examples of swimming pool, or not swimming pools, refrigerators and cars over time. If, the, uh, if you have a refrigerator in your home and you know that that refrigerator should last you five years, you look at how much a refrigerator probably is going to cost in five years, and you start saving monthly for that so that when the five years hits, you can replace your refrigerator. Well, if the five years rolls around and your refrigerator is still running just fine, you don't run out and spend that money on uh, a motorcycle. Not if you're financially smart. Instead, you go, okay, cool. I don't need to spend this money and you keep on moving. Maybe you invest the money in a CD for a year and you get a little more money out of it or, or whatever, but you keep that money rolling. So that when the refrigerator breaks down, you know, at the five year mark, you're like, I'm good. Refrigerator's running great. Three months later, the refrigerator just stops in the middle of the day. You turn to your reserve that you've set aside that savings and you replace the refrigerator immediately. So that's the idea. Now, the reserve study that we've followed is pretty conservative. Uh, and I'm, my understanding is that it may have even been conservative enough that we, we may be in a great position. I just want real numbers for that so that I can vote accordingly when, I, when I'm asked, hey, what should we do with it? And I want everybody in the community to see those conversations so that you can know where we're coming from. And then if you don't like the way I individually vote, just don't vote for me the following year. Um, or if you've never voted for me, keep not voting for me. Or if you're like, wow, it turns out he was right, and I like the fact that he was actually somebody who like wanted to think it through, well, then vote for me if I run, or, you know, or, or whatever. But it's not about me. It's really about the community. It really, really is. So this went almost 24 minutes now. I'm sorry it went so long, but most people don't watch it anyways. So for those of you who did, Thanks. I hope that gives you more insight into my thought process. Um, my apologies if I come off condescending at times. I'm just, I'm just pretty um, straightforward with this kind of stuff. And I'm not trying, to, not trying to be a jerk about it at all. And come have a conversation with me. I mean, like a real person-to-person -person conversation where we can break it down. And, and uh, I mean, I get, I'll make the time. I'll make the time. I'm a busy guy, but I'll make the time. Um, so... Anyways, if you gave this the full 25 minutes, you're awesome. Or you hate me so much that you just wanted to be able to comment on it. <laughs> so, I don't know. Do not let people live rent-free in your head. Everybody have a good night. I'm going to bed. It's super late and I got to get up early in the morning. Take care, everyone.